Well, good morning once again. It's uh, good to see you. Welcome once more to our online live streamed worship. It's good to have you with us this uh, bright and sunny Sunday morning, or possibly, I suppose, at some other time if you're watching the recording. But it's good to see that most of you have managed to have your hair cut this week. Wherever you are, and whatever the time, we hope very much that you find this helpful, that you'll somehow encounter the risen Lord Jesus Christ through our music and prayers and communion this morning. If you've got young children with you, there are some activities for them on the Wade Street Church Children's Ministry Facebook page. And after the service, uh, if you're watching live, that is, you can join us for a chat over on Zoom over your own cup of tea or coffee. We are, as ever, grateful to all those who are taking part this morning by providing music and readings and also the tech team who are doing all the behind the scenes stuff to try and get this stuff into your homes and for some of you this morning into your gardens. I know there are some small groups uh, meeting together outside to watch the service through an open door or window so a, a very special hello to you if you're watching together with some friends in a garden. Now as followers of Jesus we believe he is with us this morning just as he's with us wherever we are. So we worship him through his Holy Spirit and listen for his words to us as we offer our prayers and praise to him. And we're going to begin this morning with a reading from the glorious climax of Francis Spufford's latest novel, Light Perpetual, which is set in London. That explains why it's a bit London-centric in some of the, the references. These are almost the last words in the book. And there's a kind of psalm-like quality about them. A bit like Psalm 150, but also there's kind of echoes of Psalm 139 uh, about God is with us wherever, even if I make my bed in hell, you are there. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to read that and then that's going to lead us straight into our first song this morning, uh, Matt Redmond's Let Everything That Has Breath, which is going to be sung to us, uh, for us today by the Bridal Family. Praise him for all the postcodes, thinks Ben. Praise him on the commuter trains. Praise him upon the drum and bass. Praise him at the Ritz. Praise him in the pea-stained doorways. Praise him in nail bars. Praise him with beard oil. Praise him in toddler groups. Praise him at food banks. Praise him in the parks and playgrounds. Praise him down in the tube station at midnight. Praise him with Donna Kebabs. Praise him with Michelin stars. Praise him on Pirate Radio. Praise him on LBC and Capital. Praise him at Broadcasting House. Praise him at Poundland. Praise him in Harvey Nichols. Praise him amongst the trafficked and exploited. Praise him in hipster coffee houses. Praise him in the industrial estates. Praise him in leather bars. Praise him on the dance floors. Praise him on the sick beds. Praise him in the High Court of Parliament. Praise him in the prisons and crack houses. Praise him at Pride. Praise him at Carnival. Praise him at Millwall and West Ham, Arsenal, Chelsea and Spurs. Praise him at Eid. Praise him at High Mass. Praise him on Shabbat. Praise him in the Gospel choirs. Praise him all who hope. Praise him all who fear. Praise him all who dream. Praise him all who remember. Praise him in trouble. Praise him in joy. Let everything that has breath give praise. Praise you the morning. 
Thank you very much indeed for that, Colin and, and family. Uh, we're going to continue to praise God together now. So we're going to have a look at what folk from the congregation particularly have got to thank God for this week. Just a couple of things to say about this. Firstly, is we put this together, this little segment, on a Thursday evening. So we're really sorry if you've sent something in between Thursday and Sunday morning that it'll have to be held over uh, till next week. If you've got things to send us, please continue doing so, but send them by Thursday. And also, just want to uh, say uh, uh, congratulations this morning to Helen, Rob and Evelyn on the birth of little Marianne Jones, or Annie, as I think she's also called. Uh, mother and uh, baby are doing well, so congratulations to you as a family and welcome to Marianne. Let's uh, see what people have been up to then, and then I'll lead us in a prayer of praise. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's good to be alive, to feel the warmth of the sun and the sting of the cold on our faces and to feel the wind in our hair, to see the clouds scudding across the sky and smiles on the faces of friends, to hear the song of the birds and the music of worship, to smell the scent of flowers and the aroma of Sunday lunch, to taste the sweetness of fruit and the kisses of those we love. We thank you, not only for this wonderful world you've created in such amazing detail, but also for the senses to experience it. As we worship you like this today, and in both the vitality and busyness and the routine and the humdrum of everyday life, may we also experience the presence of your Holy Spirit deep within ourselves and know that the risen Jesus is with us and then join all creation in praise to your glorious name. Amen. And we'll say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. The words are on the screen if you want to follow. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going over to the uh, Darwin Park estate now, where Phil Beecher is waiting to read to us from John's Gospel, chapter 24, uh, 21. Sorry, it's, uh, it's a few days after Easter. And Jesus' friends have gone back up north from Jerusalem to their home territory in Galilee. So over to you, Phil. 
Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, said Simon Peter, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three, but even with so many the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Phil. Uh, before we reflect on that story a bit, let's pray. Loving God, open our ears to hear your words, open our eyes to see your ways, and open our hearts and minds to know how to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Jean Ennui, the uh, French writer and playwright, once said, life is a wonderful thing to talk about or read about in history books, but it's terrible if one has to live it. And a little more recently, uh, Nick Hornby, in his novel About a Boy, says the following about life in the 90s, which is when he wrote the book. You didn't have to have a life of your own anymore. You could just peek over the garden fence at other people's lives, as lived in the newspapers and in EastEnders and films and exquisitely sad jazz or tough rap songs. And you might have updated that in even more recent years by adding, or on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any other social media platform where it seems people build their fantasy lives now or borrow from others. Now, they're both saying what most of us know, I suppose. Our own day-to-day -day lives can sometimes seem boring, routine, unfruitful. And that's been heightened for many of us by this last year's routines of, of lockdown and lack of so many things that we once did, but have now had to put on hold. Yes, we may well believe in Jesus and that he's risen from the dead. He has had some effect on our lives, or we probably wouldn't be tuning into this today. But for most of the time, we can end up just plodding along in our ordinary, humdrum, everyday activities, trying to make ends meet, trying to cope with the kids, trying to overcome the petty or indeed not so petty frustrations that life throws up, trying to get through the next few days or weeks until something special is there to look forward to, and not least at the moment, the easing of restrictions that we've been coping with for the past year. And for Peter and his friends, those first disciples of Jesus, and that was the kind of situation they seemed to be facing. They'd seen Jesus since his resurrection. All of them except Thomas had seen him at least twice. They'd followed the instructions that they'd been given to go back up to Galilee, the, the Sea of Tiberias and Galilee, the same place, where they would meet him again. But in the end, when they got there, they'd just gone fishing back to the things they used to do, back to the routine that was necessary if they were going to eat. 
And having set out onto the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, they'd spent all night throwing out and hauling in their nets with absolutely nothing to show for it. It was a very ordinary, very frustrating situation. Life goes on. But as they were drifting across the lake in the cool of the early morning, the milky sun shining through the wispy mist, they could make out a figure on the shore who called out a greeting to them and asked if they'd caught anything. When they replied that they hadn't, he suggested they try putting the net down on the right side of the boat. It's more than possible that even from a hundred yards away, someone on the shore could see evidence of a shoal of fish that wouldn't be obvious to those immediately above it on the boat. Uh, the travel writer H.V. Morton, some of you may have come across uh, his books, he wrote a book uh, called In the Steps of the Master. And in there he writes about uh, some time that he spent uh, with fishermen on the Lake of Galilee. And they actually relied on the help of someone standing on the shore locating fish that were actually very close to the boat but they couldn't see. So they, these disciples, they follow this figure's advice. They drop their nets where he says, and when they try to pull the net in, there are 153 fish in it. Quite a catch. Whoever the eyewitness uh, was, whose, whose account we've got here, it was probably John himself, that number stuck in their mind as they counted up the catch to share out among themselves. But as the net fills with fish, one of the fishermen, again, John himself, it seems, the disciple whom Jesus loves, cries out, it's the Lord. The ordinary has become extraordinary. The frustration has disappeared. They realise that the risen Lord Jesus Christ has come on the scene. And Peter leaps into the water and strikes out for the shore while the others follow in the boat. And as they haul it up the beach, there's Jesus with breakfast ready for them. He invites them to join him and they eat together. And sitting around that little charcoal fire, eating bread and fish in the growing morning light, they know it's Jesus. But they can't bring themselves to confirm it with him. As we know from other accounts of the Easter story, there's something about Jesus that means that people don't immediately recognise him, but there's no doubt that it is him. He is there. It's the Lord. He's made the ordinary extraordinary for them. Their routine, that fishing trip that they've done hundreds of times before, has been transformed. Their frustration has been overcome. It must have been a, a scene of some bewilderment, but also a scene of great joy. And you can imagine those fishermen whispering to one another over their bread and fish, it's the Lord, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. He makes the ordinary extraordinary by his presence. In the middle of the routine activities of our lives, in the long, dull periods of work and duty, during the times when we seem to be making no progress at all, Jesus is actually there. His presence is with us. We know that. We've read it in the Bible. We've sung about it in our hymns and songs. We've heard it proclaimed from the pulpit times without number. We've said amen to it in countless prayers. We don't need to invite Jesus to be present with us. He's promised that he will be, and so he is. We believe in his resurrection. We are sent to the creeds and go along with all the stuff about the Holy Spirit. But we need to say, to articulate with those first disciples, it's the Lord. To acknowledge for ourselves that he's here and to receive from him. With his presence, Jesus can make the ordinary extraordinary. He can bring a sense of purpose and meaning to our everyday situations. He is fully alive, a risen Lord and Saviour who is still active in this world through the presence of his Holy Spirit. And he wants us to be fully alive too, to be aware of the possibilities that there are in each and every situation, to enable us to see each action, each word of our daily lives as a, a participation in him, in his life. There was nothing special about that meal that Cleopas and his companion shared at in Emmaus that we thought about a couple of weeks ago. But Jesus' presence made it special. There was nothing special about going fishing on Galilee, but Jesus' presence made it special. 
In chapter 10 of, uh, of this gospel, John's gospel, John records Jesus' words about himself as the gate. I am the gate and I am the good shepherd. And in verse 10 in that little passage, Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. One of the great themes of John's gospel all the way through. Jesus comes to bring life. He starts off in, in chapter one, in him was life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And again and again, uh, there are those references to life. Jesus wants us to enjoy life, to enjoy the things that occupy our time and our thoughts. He wants us to know the joy and freedom of his presence. And that doesn't mean that our situations are necessarily gonna change. Acknowledging Jesus' presence doesn't lead immediately to wonderful new jobs or untold material riches or even to mighty ministries of evangelism and healing. But it can lead to a renewed sense of joy, to a sense of fulfilment and satisfaction. Now, just to underline that and acknowledge the reality of that again so there's no misunderstanding. The presence of Jesus doesn't always necessarily make the problems actually go away doesn't mean that life suddenly becomes a bowl of cherries. It doesn't take the difficulties out of life or magically transform illness into health, poverty into wealth, routine into constant excitement. The gospel is not the simplistic Christianity by numbers that some people, whether the, the prosperity preachers or the diehard legalists might claim it is. Not all the people who saw Jesus after the resurrection became high profile apostles and preachers and healers. Most of them actually went back to their homes and their jobs, but lived life with the amazing knowledge that they'd encountered Jesus. And nothing was ever gonna be quite the same again after that. And that can be the same for us because what I believe Jesus says to us today through this story is that our lives can be transformed from boring, frustrating routines by encountering him and acknowledging that encounter. How often do you stop during a day to say, it's the Lord? How often do you pause in the tasks you're engaged in to remind yourself that Jesus is with you? When things don't go the way you want them to, like those fishless fishermen on Galilee, do you ever simply ask Jesus, who is there, who is there with you, to make himself known to you as you grapple with those issues? Towards the end of the uh, 17th century, a French monk known today as Brother Lawrence wrote a, a series of letters and principles which have been gathered together over the years along with the records of his, some of his conversations in, in a volume called The Practice of the Presence of God. And in it, he writes this. The most holy practice, the nearest to daily life and the most essential for the spiritual life is the practice of the presence of God. That is to find joy in his divine company and to make it a habit of life, speaking humbly and conversing lovingly with him at all times, every moment, without rule or restriction, above all at times of temptation, distress, dryness and revulsion, and even of faithlessness and sin. We should apply ourselves continually so that without exception, all our actions become small occasions of fellowship with God. That last phrase is really what we're trying to get at today. All our actions become small occasions of fellowship with God. The risen Lord Jesus is there with you. He is alive. He's promised to be with you at all times. And his promises never fail. It's just we don't always take him up on them. We don't pause to say to ourselves and to others, it's the Lord. We don't allow him to make the ordinary extraordinary by his presence. A while ago, a few years back now, I had to do a bit of study on um, Celtic Christian spirituality. And one of the things that I noticed and it impressed me about it all is the way in which everything from milking the cow and making a fire to greeting a friend and sharing a meal was blessed with prayer, with a spoken acknowledgement that Jesus is present and active. That's partly why I chose those words of Francis Spufford to lead, uh, to, to lead us into our worship today. And in a few moments, we're going to be sharing together in communion. We'll be, I expect, hoping to encounter Jesus through the, uh, the prayers, the, the bread, the wine. But our encounters with him are not limited to such spiritual, religious 
occasions. Look out for him wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever time of day or night it is. He's there, if only you will look, even in the difficulties and uncertainties and confusion of this current time. And when you see him, even if, like the disciples, you dare not ask him what he's doing there, he will make a difference to your life. It will no longer be, as Jean Henri said, terrible to live your life. You will not have to live it, as Nick Cornby said, through fantasies and Facebook. Just look. It's the Lord. And as we prepare to share in communion once again today, and I hope expect to meet Jesus in that particular uh, context, we're going to be led in another song. This time it's by Ollie and Emily Nichols, uh, who, are, who are leading it. Um, it's a song by Stuart Townend and Keith Getty, a reminder to us that we are people of the risen King. Let's sing together. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Ollie and Emily, for that song this morning. In this place where heaven and earth meet under the rainbow of God's promise, in this sharing of bread and wine, future hope becomes reality now. So bring your heart-leaping joys. 
Bring your eye-reddening sorrows. Bring your huge, broad-brush dreams. Bring your stifling, paralyzing frustrations. Bring your exciting, hope-filled anticipations. Bring your urgent, scary concerns. Bring your deep and dark regrets. Bring your burdensome, anxious sins to this table, where your host says, Behold, I make all things new. He meets you here. He is here. It's the Lord. And he bids you eat and live. Truly live. And as you take this bread and wine, remember what it signifies and why Jesus had to do what he did. Because we're in constant need of God's forgiveness. So once again this morning, we recognise that in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, forgive us for all those times when you have stood beside us and we've looked the other way. For all those times when you have spoken and we've chosen not to hear. For all those times when you have lavished your gifts on us and we have rejected them or misused them. For all those times when you have shown us a better way and we have stubbornly continued to tread our own. We thank you that you continue to lead us, give to us, speak to us and stand with us as you have promised. Help us to receive your forgiveness and with it the power and assurance of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Our God is faithful and strong. In his faithfulness, he stands by you. With his strength, he upholds you. In his grace, he forgives you. Receive his forgiveness and live in the light of his presence. St Paul writes about the occasion when Jesus first shared the bread and wine like this with his disciples. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This blood, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as Jesus did, we give thanks to God in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, creator and redeemer of us all, we give you thanks and praise that you want us to meet with you here this morning. We thank you for what brings us here, a desire not only to meet you, but also to express our unending gratitude for what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. We can never adequately thank you for the sacrifice which he made for us on the cross and for the transformation that he brings to our lives. Our words and our understanding are limited, but we pray that you'll accept them and with them, our commitment to live for you, looking out day by day for the presence of the risen Lord Jesus with us and ready for all that that might entail. Thank you for this bread and wine, which remind us once again of Jesus' sacrifice and your amazing grace. Send your Holy Spirit to fill us as we eat and drink. And may this short time of remembering encourage and equip us for the week ahead, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, when I've broken the bread and, and blessed the wine, we're going to hear a song by Phil and John. Some of you may remember Phil and John from way back when. It's a song entitled Redemption's Song.
And if you've got bread and wine with you this morning, wherever you are, if you're at home or in a garden or, or whatever, then eat and drink while the music plays and pray that you'll be aware of the presence of the risen Lord Jesus Christ with you this morning. So after he'd prayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. And whenever you eat it, remember me. And after they'd eaten, he took the cup and he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever you drink it, remember me. So let's eat and drink together with hearts full of gratitude. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Living Jesus, come in glory. We continue in prayer. Let's pray. 
almighty and ever-loving God. We come before you once again today with our prayers and petitions, knowing that you are able to do far more than we can ask or even imagine. Things in our world and in our lives are not as we would want them to be, and we find ourselves anxious and uncertain for ourselves and for others. We thank you that we're currently able to enjoy a little more freedom from the restrictions that we've had to put up with for so long. But we pray that this will not lead to further spread of the virus. Give wisdom and integrity to those who have to make decisions about it all and on behalf of us all. And please lead them and us in your ways of truth and justice. We pray for those whom we know who are unwell in body, mind or spirit. Bring your healing and wholeness. We pray for those who are mourning and who have found it difficult to express their grief at this time. Remembering particularly our Queen and her family following the death of Prince Philip. We pray for those who are struggling to encounter Jesus in their own situation. May our lives proclaim the presence of the risen Lord Jesus Christ in all that we say and do. Throughout your world, Lord, bring peace to the troubled, dignity to the downtrodden, hope to the hopeless, joy to the joyless, and strength to to the weak and in it all may the glory go to you alone we pray in Jesus name amen well Ollie and Emily are going to lead us in uh, a final song now a reminder that all we need comes from God the same power with Ollie and Emily please join in where you are uh, the words will be on the screen
contain the power of his name death you overcame once and for all the grave could not contain the power of his name death you overcame once and for all the grave could not contain Well, thanks once again for that music, uh, Ollie and Emily, and thank you to the Bridles for the music earlier on. Uh, thanks too to Phil for reading this morning, uh, to all of those who sent in your items for thanks and praise uh, today, and also to Colin, James, Steve, and to Mark this week for their work on the production. We'll be back again on YouTube next week, uh, but don't forget you can also watch this as a recording on our YouTube channel. So let your friends and, and anyone else who's missed it know, or if you just want to have another look at those badgers at the bottom of uh, Phil and Jan Webb's garden and you missed it earlier on, have a look at those. Some of our activities are getting back to live face-to-face -face events, house groups in gardens and youth and children's activities, all that kind of thing. Uh, and we hope to be able to meet together in a limited way for live worship on a Sunday before too long. We hope uh, on Pentecost Sunday, May the 23rd, that will be happening. But until then, uh, if you need to get in touch with us, please use the contact details on the screen at the end of this service. If you want to follow up on anything or you want to ask any questions, you want to explore a little bit about what we believe, then please get in touch with us. We'd be delighted to help you. But now, a final prayer and blessing. Make yourself real to us once again this week, loving God, so that wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we can exclaim, it is the Lord, and know his life-enhancing presence with us. And now, may the peace of the Lord go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love, this week and forevermore. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. It's uh, been good to have your company, even, even at a bit of a distance. Uh, we hope and pray that you've found it helpful and we hope you'll join us again very soon. But until then, have a great week. Goodbye.